Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the Ideas to Market webinar. Uh, I have everybody currently muted. If we can, I'll uh, answer some questions towards the, or at the end of the, uh, at the webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to help entrepreneurs and inventors understand how you can self-evaluate your idea without outlaying a lot of cash. And this has been tailored as an entry-level presentation. In this webinar, you will find out how to objectively assess your idea or opportunity through simple analysis of your idea, your customers, your competitors, and potential collaborators. The Ideas to Market program is proudly supported by the Queensland Government and Shelson IP. Since 2005, the Ideas to Market small business program has assisted more than 1,500 entrepreneurs and small business owners taking their ideas to market. This webinar is facilitated by myself. I'm driving the bus today. I'm Scott Visser. I'm the Collaboration and Consultancy Services Manager of the Australian Institute for Commercialisation and I'm the Program Manager for the Queensland Inventor Service. The Queensland Inventor Service is a free online program for Queenslanders that, provide, that provides access to some consultation time, business tools and guides. At the end of the presentation we'll put up a link of where you can find the Queensland Inventor Service. During the webinar all attendees' microphones will be muted to avoid any interference or background noise. If you have any questions during the webinar, please jot them down as we'll have time for questions at the end. All right, so let's begin. Adding value to your idea. Now I love this slide, I love this photo. These questions are valuable because not all ideas or inventions will be successful and these questions can save you money. What I want to do is draw your attention to the, to the image tricks. For an example, this is a real patent. It was issued in 1882 by Wild Earp. Mr. Earp created or come up with this design for rodent control. As you can see, it's broken down into several different components. It's the pistol. There's a frame that holds the whole mechanism together. There's a triggering point and there's a lever that seems to press up against the trigger of the gun. While I don't have the information as to what the pattern details are about, the concept is pretty clear. And as we go through today's presentation, I'll draw back to this particular image and this concept as a bit of an example of what would work and what may not work. So question one, getting right into it. Have you conducted any research to ensure that you are not reinventing the wheel or infringing on other people's intellectual property rights? So really what you need to ask here is, has it been done before or is somebody researching it now? Have you searched for existing or similar products or services using IP databases, registered patents, trademarks or designs or even the internet? Can you operate without infringing someone else's IP? So one of the big questions that I get is, I've, been, I've got this idea and I did a quick search and nobody's done it before. Well, the answer is somebody probably has done it before or tried to do it before, but they used a different method to, to achieve it. And the following example, going back to Wired Earp's uh, mousetrap with the pistol, is we can see that a normal mousetrap, uh, mouse poison, or even our local domestic cat are all perfect examples of where the, the, the rodent problem could have been solved by alternate models or methods rather. So you can see that if he had done his appropriate search or had, had the appropriate advice, he may not have may not have proceeded with doing a patent. Back in 1882 they probably didn't have the rodent pellets, but they certainly had domestic cats and they certainly had a mousetrap. So one would have to question why why the thought that a pistol a pistol focused mousetrap would have been important. But there you go. Question two. Do you have documents to clearly prove that you own or have the rights to commercialise your idea? Failure to produce validated documentation can potentially lead to disputes over the intellectual property rights and rights to commercialise. And I'll come back to this. Examples of proof of ownership include laboratory notes, working papers such as a journal, employment or business contracts that capture and assign ownership, a licensing agreement to use another's idea. So, a common mistake a lot of inventors do is they get very excited about their idea and they tell other people and they want other people to help. 
other people contribute to your ideas. That's called collaboration, and collaboration is very important in the in the progress of an idea. If you haven't captured the rights to to that intellectual property property as it is developed, you may not have the opportunity to patent and protect your idea down the track. So it's important that you can demonstrate that you come up with the idea, that you've been working on the idea, and more importantly, when you've engaged other people, that you have captured the, their involvement and assigned the IP over to yourself. Drawing on our example, if somebody had challenged Wired Earp over the ownership of his design, such as the trigger me mechanism, could he prove it? In other words, what part of that overall mousetrap did White actually create? Did he create the gun? Chances are that was a Smith & Wesson or uh, somebody else owned that. Uh, did he create the trigger mechanism or did he just create the frame? In that particular case, he would need to be able to demonstrate that he was the actual owner of that concept or he had approval from all the parties involved to proceed with the patent. Question three. Have you protected your idea through obtaining a patent, trademark, registered design, copyright or other recognised process? A lot of people out in the marketplace will say, don't patent your idea because it's very expensive and it's not worth it. In some situations that may actually be true and if you're going for market advantage you may not see the need to patent your idea, especially if you're in a volatile market where technology or markets change very quickly. Let me get rid of that. Uh, what protecting your idea does is it gives you a seat at the table. So if I've got a potential supplier or purchase buyer of my idea and he says to me, do you have a patent for your idea? And I say no. The chances that of him getting up and walking away are very high because he doesn't need to talk to you. He can actually go and reinvent your idea now that he knows that it exists. With a patent, it gives you a strong bargaining power. It keeps your competitors away from your market. So that's very important if you, if you think that you could capture a large amount of market share really quickly and you want to prevent other people from getting in there. And it becomes an asset that can gain value and be traded or sold. In other words, you may not necessarily want to work with that intellectual property down the track, but you may find somebody that is willing to buy it. Now, if it's patented, then it adds value to, to that negotiation point. Does, does having a patent guarantee success? The answer is no. Having a patent doesn't guarantee success and you'll find if you did a quick search in, in any of the global patent offices, there are a lot of patents that have never gone anywhere. Wyatt Earp did patent his idea. Oh dear. Uh, Wyatt Earp did patent his idea. Was it successful? Well, in 1882 it might have been successful, but it certainly hasn't transferred through to to uh, today's market, so the answer is no. Have you made sure that your idea has been kept confidential when demonstrating, discussing or presenting it to external parties? Collaborating with others will allow your idea to grow, but without suitable diligence and protection you may not be able to patent or protect your idea. Things not to do. Tell your friends and relatives. Now, if your friends or relatives are going into a business partnership with you, then you probably want to tell them. But you've got to remember that what you're doing is you're spreading the risk of somebody taking your idea and working on it themselves. Post your information onto forums. It's great that you've got an idea, but if you post it onto a forum, it becomes a public becomes public knowledge and you're not going to be able to get a patent for it. Tell the local reporter. This actually uh, happens quite often. A person will get an idea, they think they've got some sort of revolutionary technology and the first thing they do is they go and tell the local newspaper. Unfortunately what that does is it conveys to the world that here's a great new technology and anybody can do it. You're not going to get protection. Uh, and meet a potential business partner without a confidential agreement in place. There's a lot of discussion on, on the validity of confidentiality agreements. They protect you when you negotiate. It's important to have a confidentiality agreement in place. It makes you feel more confident when you're talking to people that you're going to be treated a little bit more credible and it gives you security that they're going to retain the confidential information. Question five. Can your idea be commercialised without relying to any great extent on other IP or products? Reliance on other people's intellectual property may mean that you are not able to control development of the opportunity. In our Wyatt example, Wyatt may have designed and built the trap, 
but did he own the designs or have the ability to manufacture the gun? So in this particular case, did Wyatt Earp have freedom to operate? In other words, he may have designed the, the whole mechanism. He may have designed the whole mechanism for the mousetrap, but if he didn't actually uh, manuf uh, design the gun or get a license to use the gun, then his ability to actually manufacture the mousetrap is rather small. And again, does he have to rely on others? Well, he would have to rely on others. The manufacturer of the gun might turn around and say, I'm sorry, we don't want to do that, in which particular case his whole patent has been a waste of money. Can you provide, can you provide that the idea works and can be reproduced? This is, this is all about building a prototype. Being able to demonstrate your idea works will add value to your intellectual property provide a stronger bargaining position and credibility, allow for design improvement and catch any unforeseen design problems. A pattern is very important, after a pattern, a prototype is very important because you'll find as you're building your prototype that you will make changes as you go to suit the needs of, of where you want to sell the product. So you want to get a prototype in place. Demonstrating the idea works may include building a working prototype, have an independent validation conducted, do some preliminary product testing, conduct full-scale trials. Depending on the market and the industry that you're trying to sell your product into will determine what level of testing or prototyping you need. If it's pharmaceuticals, you may need a laboratory and 10 years worth of R&D and, and regulation monitoring to, uh, to even get to the market. If you're going into industries like oil and gas, you may need to be able to demonstrate at, on a full-scale level that your product works before they're taken into consideration. If you're just building uh, some sort of plumbing, plumbing device, then maybe a small, simple product that is verified by an engineer or somebody that can, that can test the product to make sure it works is all you need. It is better for the prototype to fail and facilitate a new design approach than to proceed with the commercial operations only to have it fail on a grand scale. Uh, I can speak from experience for that when I designed a particular product for the oil and gas industry and not really understanding the design limitations, it broke and destroyed a valuable part of the equipment downstream that wasn't ours. So we had to go back to the drawing board, but it cost us a lot of money to fix. If we had done the prototype first, we probably would have found those faults. So prototypes are very important. Have you made sure that your idea meets the relevant laws, industry standards and regulations that apply to it? For example, does it meet the requirements for public safety, environmental and construction standards? What approvals need to be gained and how long will it take? Poor design may mean that the product may not be approved by authorities, which is a significant barrier to the development and entry into your identified market. It is important that all laws, standards and regulatory requirements are clearly identified and plans are implemented to minimise that risk. So what this question is saying is that you've got an idea, congratulations, you've got an idea, but it, and let's take a pharmaceutical product. If you know that there are all these regulations and rules and testing and clinical testing that you need to go through, right at the concept of creating that idea, you need to plan that out ahead. So when you're negotiating with people, you've taken that information into consideration as you go forward. Our, using our example, could Wyatt Earp sell his mousetrap in Australia? Well, we've got strict gun laws now that says we can't use firearms, especially not in a, in a, in a product such as his mousetrap. So the chances are he wouldn't be able to sell that here. And that is really because of the regulations that set up. Question eight. Have you conducted some research to help you understand the industry that your idea applies to? Before starting a new venture, it is important to understand the basic characteristics of the industry that you will be working in. Each industry is different and you will need to determine how to best enter the market and or determine whether it is feasible to do so. So it's great that you've got an idea uh, and you may think, well, I can sell this idea to this particular market you've got to actually look at that market and see what the operational and the environmental conditions are that allows you to get into that market. If you haven't taken that into consideration, there's no point spending all your time and money and energy creating your product for that market and only having it blocked at the first point of entry because you haven't done your homework. 
each industry is different and you should consider the current trends, the product life cycles, market gaps, how big the industry is, is that industry actually growing or declining and what are the barriers to entry and we'll cover barriers to, of entry a little bit later on. But again, you need to understand where your market is going. So if you're designing um, some computer hardware devices, then you need to know that your, your market is moving very fast under, under the Moore's Law and that you're going to have to be quick enough to get in and have an exit strategy to get out. Otherwise, the technology may move on while you're still working on your product. And the same goes with apps. You know, you're writing an app on a particular platform, the platforms get upgraded every six to 12 months. So you need to time when that, when that platform may change so that you can get in early enough to capitalise uh, as quickly as you can. Question nine, have you identified who the potential customers are for your idea? The entire population of the world is not your target market. I hear that so often, oh, I've got an idea and I'm going to sell it to everybody in the world. It doesn't work that way. Market segmentation, which is uh, more academic, I won't go into the won't go into depth about market segmentation, but market segmentation involves dividing a broad target market into a subset of consumers who have a common needs. Different segments have different needs and that's important to understand. So if we go down a little bit to Wyatt Earp's mousetrap, he, he might have said, well, I can sell this to three or four different groups. I can sell it to farmers who have rodent problems. I can sell it to the local domestic households or I can sell it to my enemies in hoping that they'll shoot them in the foot. Each of those would have a different strategy. Each of those groups would have a different need for that particular product and you need to understand why they would want that product for that, that satisfies that need. If the product does not generate a demand that fulfills the need or wants of a customer, there is a risk it won't be purchased. Okay, so we like to we like to enforce the idea that it must satisfy a need. You can certainly sell a product that doesn't satisfy a need, but your strategy changes and you'll find it a lot harder. Question 10. Do you have valid information about what the target customer's needs are and how they would value your idea? So this is an extension from question 9. We've talked about having a look at the what areas you think your product might work in. Now we're actually looking at the user itself. Does your idea satisfy a need or a want in the marketplace? Do they want it? Does your idea solve a problem? Does your idea meet all the requirements to sell into the desired market? In other words, there's no point saying that this particular group of people over here would love your product, but the barriers of entry is so high that you're never going to get it there. So you don't want to focus your time and energy on that. Why would they buy it? Why would they buy it? can't say that enough. Why would they buy your idea or your product? You've got to, you've got to really focus on that. If you, you, you might need to change your idea or your product to suit that need, which is, which is more than valid. It is easier to sell a needed solution than to push a product or service to market. It is okay to change your idea for different market types, especially if it satisfies different market needs. So if we go back to Wyatt's, um, Wyatt's mousetrap, for example, and we identify three different market types, well, he might find that the domestic household liked that idea of a, of a mousetrap, but they weren't quite happy with the, the construction of it and the way it looked because, after all, it's going to sit in the lounge room. Maybe it should look a little bit more aesthetically pleasing, whereas the farmers might just want the rough, the rough type. It's going to be out in the haystack. You know, they don't care. Well, yeah. So, you know, it's okay to change your idea. In White's case, did the local community need a new mouse trap if they already had cats and spring-based traps? So, going back to why would they buy it? Did White really think about why they would buy it if they already had cats? You know, maybe cats were unavailable, or if they already had spring-loaded traps. It's, it was 1882. Question 11. Have you obtained information about products that are similar to your idea or could be substituted for it? A lot of people think that they've got a new idea and there is no competitors. Everyone has competitors. Going back to Wyatt Earp and his mousetrap, he had three competitors. He didn't know about it. And those competitors weren't actually people building 
uh, pistol-loaded mousetraps. They were actually other product types that could solve the same problem. Using the information gained from your market research, work out how you would differ from your competitors in your chosen market. What we like to do is, in your research for your idea, identify who your, who your com, uh, competitors are. Have a look at their product. Compare their product versus yours. If yours has extra features, if it has extra value, it does extra things, then what you do is you focus on your selling point on those extra features because everything else can be done by the, by the competitor. So your selling point or your value proposition are what is better than your competition. If you do not differ enough, it is unlikely that you will succeed against established competitors. You have to be fundamentally different that satisfies that need to, to make those sales. Inexpensive ways to develop a competitive edge. Offer quality service, be flexible, personalise service, offer value for money and develop your image. Or start building on a brand. Question 12. Have you identified barriers to entry? So we've touched on this a little bit. Uh, typical barriers to market entry include legislation and regulations. Change of government. Change of government can be a significant barrier. Long negotiation times, tariffs, foreign exchange rates, culture, social, religious and racial norms are the most common forms of barriers, uh, especially if you're trying to sell particular products to other countries. Logistics. If, you go, if you've got large volume of products and you put it on a, on a boat, it could take you a few months to get it to market. Payment policies or payment terms, 30, 60, 90 or 120 day terms are now common, depending on what industry you're in. So you may find that you don't want to sell your product into a market that has 120 day terms. And the weather, weather uh, has significant effect on markets. Each of these and many more may offer a significant barrier to future success. It is therefore important to assess these risks by taking full environmental review to develop a plan to manage these risks where possible. Now, the key word here is the environmental review. What this means is, in your analysis of your idea, you'll have a look at yourself and what you can do in your networks and how you can take that idea together. But you also need to take a moment to actually think about what's happening outside in the world that may affect your business. Some trends may occur, some political change may occur, you know, some, some storms might come through. These are the sort of things that can have an effect on how you're trying to get your product or your idea to market. So you need to take into consideration these things and plan for them. You're not, you're not ever going to foresee that they're going to happen and sometimes they won't happen, but at least take it into consideration as you plan. Question 13. Have you developed relationships with the people or firms that you need to work with to commercialise your idea? And I, your idea is that the more people you talk to, the more value your idea will gain. Your idea will also change because people will bring their experience and their knowledge and their skills and their tools to your idea and they'll say, your idea would be great over here if we do this and you'll go, great, and your idea changes. And a lot of times people with an idea will find the idea they started with is not the idea that they ended with. Technical contributors, manufacturers and distributors, these are the sort of people that you're going to need to, to meet and to negotiate with and to actually think about long-term relationships with to start generate, getting your idea to the marketplace. New relationships take time to build. They do. You, you, if it's a good relationship, then over the course of three, five years' time, you'll build up a, a good, successful relationship. Potential partners can add value to your idea as they have established knowledge and practices. So I always like the idea of when I was first an inventor and I was designing these cast metal parts and I'm sitting there at my desk and I'm drawing these things up going, yeah, that looks great. But when I actually took it to the foundry or the factory floor, the, the people there said, well, you know, if you change this, then you'll get better flow, flow rates. And if you change this gate point here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to save you 10% of your cost. Now, that's the sort of stuff that you need to embrace to change your idea that adds value. What to look for in your partners? Well, you want to decide if you want a passive partner or an active partner. Uh, industry knowledge, track record, trustworthiness, referrals, contacts and networks, long-term relationships, capacity for funding. These are the sort of things that you, 
I guess what I'm trying to get to here is that you've got an idea and you need to build these networks and these relationships to get your idea off the ground. Don't just jump straight to the first person that sticks his hand up and says, I can help you. Be thorough in your analysis. Go to their site, meet their staff, have a look at their property and their conditions, have a look at their history and their products and, and the market that they've worked in and see whether or not they have credibility, capacity and trustworthiness to actually proceed. All right, because this is your idea, they're already established, they're looking for opportunities to improve their own portfolio, but they really do need to be the right people for your mix. Look them in the eye, if you feel comfortable with the way that they operate, proceed. Question 14, have you established a team with defined roles and responsibilities? Task and role management play an important part in the development of any idea. So you've got your idea, and now you need to actually turn it into something that, that you can take to the market. It requires a lot of different skill sets. Do you have the skills or can draw on somebody else with the skills to achieve the desired outcomes? So going back to the previous slide, one of your partners might be somebody that has a skill set that is different from what you have, but is complementary in what you need to take the idea forward. The following list is a list of typical skill sets that people need to get an idea off the ground. You know, operations, business development and networking, commercialization and R&D ability, strategic IP, uh, entrepreneurial, marketing, strategic relationship building, accounting and legal advice and manufacturing. There are a lot of academics, uh, there are a lot of academics that develop intellectual property quite often. Do they have the capacity to take that IP and turn it into a business? Some do, a lot don't. But when they, when they recognise that they don't have the capacity to take it to market and they find people who have an interest and they share in that belief and they, take, they bring their own skill sets, then they can take that idea forward and you can build a partnership. So don't be afraid to identify that you don't have all the skills. First, just be ready to identify what skills you need and then find somebody who has them. Question 15. Have you got the required funds to take your idea to the next stage of development and or to the market? The million dollar question. As the program manager for the Inventor Service, a lot of people ring me up and say, I've got no money. Uh, and look, that's a common place most inventors do start. Uh, your current financial position will challenge your ideal business model. Okay, Just because you've got no money doesn't mean your idea can't get off the ground. It's a lot harder but you need to have a think about how you're going to build credibility in your idea so that when you do meet people who can provide the funding, you've got the information that supports your idea enough that they're, they're willing to buy in and help you uh, through funding. Okay? Types of funding will include grants, banks, investors, partners or your own personal funds. As an inventor, never mortgage your house. Okay? A lot of people do. Stick with your day job. Use, treat your invention as a hobby until such time as you can start seeing a, a, some extra funding coming in. For all of the categories apart from personal funds, you will, in, you will need to address all these presented questions before you engage them, so be ready. So banks, grants, investors, these people are going to see, want to know that you've looked at the markets, you've looked at the competitors, you've got your prototype, you've done your patent. They want to see that because it's all part of the credibility, your credibility and your product's credibility. So be ready to have them. Final thoughts. Considering the information presented will provide you with the tools to create a stronger opportunity or to realise an idea that is not worth pursuing. The final part of that statement is, is important. Just because you've got an idea doesn't mean the market needs it and sometimes you need to accept that maybe the market's not ready for your idea or the market has found alternative solutions to the problem. This process helps you identify that. Doing your research will find your potential markets, your potential partners, your potential competitors and open the door to new opportunities very important that you do your research first. Your research can be done for free. The internet is a great provider of research. There is so much information there now that just with a little bit of lateral thinking you can ha you can get most of the answers you need. And there, the internet is a great and cost effective way to conduct research. 
It takes many ideas to have a good idea. It's a bit of a broad statement there, but what that's suggesting is that you start with an idea and then you have a look at all the different markets that you can sell that idea to and all of a sudden your idea changes or morphs into a new idea. And then as you start evaluating and investigating those markets more, you may decide that those new ideas may be successful, may be feasible or may not be. So you need to have a look at all your different market types and all your different ideas as they change to determine whether or not they're going to be successful. You will find a market that is good for your idea, it just may not be the first one you look at. Don't be afraid to collaborate with others, just protect yourself first. Collaboration, as I've touched on, is very important. You need help and support from as many people as you can. Don't be afraid to ask for help because everybody can add value. Just protect yourself first. Understand your market and how your idea can solve a need. It is easier to sell a needed solution than to push an idea the market does not need. I can't, I, I would read that statement again. It, it's, it's so important. If you can find a need in the marketplace for your idea, the chances that your market will buy it is, is strong. You'll need a different strategy, a different process if the market doesn't need your idea and you're going to pursue it anyway. The AIC Inventor Service. The, AI, the Inventor Service can help you understand the steps involved in taking your idea to market. Objectively assess your idea and opportunity before you invest time and money in it. Plan your next steps. And it has a, it, it's a website, with, that's, it, that's a web portal, it has lots of useful guides, lots of templates, lots of links to search engines and things like that that you can draw upon. It has case studies and it has some other assistance as well. They're the links that you can uh, use to, to get access to the Australian Inventor Service or the Ideas to Market uh, website and we're on Twitter and World Wide Web. And that's the end of our presentation so I'd like to thank you.